several elderly nuns who were on the second floor of their convent one night, a uh, fire broke out in the convent. When they realized that fire was blocking the exit, they took their habits off of their head and they, these nuns tied their habits together and they made it uh, like a rope which, with which they exited out the second floor window down to the ground where they were, where they were safe. And there was a reporter there reporting on this fire and, and he asked one of the nuns, weren't you afraid that the habits uh, could have ripped or broke since they're so old? To which the nun replied, not at all. Don't you know that old habits are hard to break? Yeah, I've got a lot of thumbs down here. <laughs> There is a point to that. We'll get there in a minute. <laughs> We're in a series in Genesis. If you've been around for a while, the last six months, and uh, this is the first book of the Bible. Today we are in chapter 20. And so I want to just start reading there. We're going to read the first couple of verses and make a few comments, and then we'll read the rest of the text. Genesis chapter 20, verse 1. Abraham moved south to the Negev and lived for a while between Kadesh and Shur. And then he moved on to Gerar. While living there as a foreigner, Abraham introduced his wife Sarah by saying, she is my sister. So King Abimelech of Gerar sent for Sarah and had her brought to him at his palace. You might be thinking this morning, I've heard this story before. This is a little deja vu and I wanna just remind you six weeks ago, Pastor Luke and I joined together preaching a message this morning. Pastor Luke is in the chapel. I'm here. It seems a little deja vu, but we preached a message out of Genesis chapter 12. If you will remember, uh, Abraham and Sarah, then Abram and Sarah, I had, had moved to the promised land, and they found when they got there, immediately there was a famine with which they took off and went to Egypt. And if you'll look in that story in Genesis chapter 12, verse 11, as they are approaching the border of Egypt, Abram says to Sarai, listen, I'm a little afraid for my life here. We're going into this territory of Egypt, and I'm afraid that Pharaoh is going to see how beautiful you are, and he's going to want you for his wife. And so let's just tell him that you're my sister. We've been here before. This was 25 years have passed, and now we've got Abram, Abraham, nearly 100 years old, going into a foreign land, and he goes back to the same old thing. God fixed that mess back in chapter 12. He did a phenomenal job. Abraham came out of that looking pretty good. But here we are again, 25 years later, Abraham slipping back into the same old sins of lies and deception out of fear and selfishness and self-reliance. And King Abimelech, what he was fearful that King Abimelech would want Sarah to come into his, his home and be his wife, that's exactly what he did because they said, she's my sister. There's a tendency in all of us to slip back, to revert to our old ways of thinking, to our old ways of doing things. And I wanna challenge you this morning to have your heart wide open. At the end of the message this morning, we're gonna have a time of prayer. And I wanna pray for every one of us because I believe in the days that we're living, there's not one of us who is exempt from slipping back and falling into old ways of thinking, into old ways of doing things. There's not one of us that is immune to fear. There's not one of us that is perfect and incapable of sinning. All of us are in that boat today. And so I want, I want to challenge you this morning, and we're going to end with prayer, and I want us to pray for our lives, our marriages, our families, our children, that God would have his way. So here's this situation. How did, how did Abraham get here again? God had spoken to him just two chapters earlier in chapter 18 with specifics. Now, God has given Abraham a promise. And specifically in chapter 18, they had, a, they had visitors, three guests, three angels who were there. And one of them spoke to Abraham and Sarah and said, by this time next year, Sarah will give birth to a son. It will be Abraham and Sarah's son, and you are to name him Isaac. That was two chapters ago. 
So we can probably assume at this point, because if you read just a little bit on in the first part of chapter 21, Sarah gives birth to a son, and they name him Isaac. So here they are. They're going to Gerar. King Abimelech has Sarah brought into his harem. And I can say that we could probably presume that she's pregnant at this stage of the game. And I, I think of, of you wives. I, I'm sure all of the wives that are here would say, your husband has done some boneheaded things in your life and in your marriage. True? Women? But I would dare say that he has not done something as boneheaded as lie to a king and, and let you join his harem. I can't imagine giving my wife up to some other man, especially when God has given a promise. But here is Abraham slipping back. I mean, probably seven, eight, nine times, God has confirmed this promise to Abraham since chapter 12 that he would be a father of a great nation, that he would have countless descendants, that he would have a son born to he and Sarah. So how do they get here again? How is he slipping back into the same old sin? How is he going back to lies and deceptions of 25 years ago? They say that old habits are hard to break. There, see, there was a point to that story. Old habits are hard to break, and it's hard to teach an old dog. See, how do we know these things? Now, that's not, that's not an, a, an excuse for any of us. That's just understanding this is our nature. It helps us to understand. But listen to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 22. A dog returns to its vomit. I'm sorry to be so graphic this morning, but that's what Scripture says. A dog returns to its vomit, and a sow that is washed returns to her wallowing in the mud. Why? That's just their nature. Dogs yak, and then they go eat it. That's true. How many of you know it's true? Okay, you have dogs, you know that's what happened. And I don't care how clean you can make your pig, she's just gonna go back to the mud because that's her nature, that's what she likes to do. We have nature, we have a sin nature inside of every single one of us. Listen to what the Proverbs say. A dog returns to its vomit, so, as a dog returns to its vomit, so a fool returns to their folly. There's something inside of us. There's something in our nature that makes us want to just draw back to those old ways of doing things. But listen, the plan God has for us is that we grow in wisdom, that we grow in dependence on him so that we don't keep going back to the old sinful ways of doing things and to our foolishness. I'm a Sam's Club member, and I've been a Sam's Club member for almost 30 years now. It's hard to believe. You might be a Costco person. How many have a membership to Sam's Club? Costco. Raise your hand if you're a member of one of those two places. I love Sam's Club. There is no better place where you can go buy a rotisserie chicken, a 65-inch TV, 400 rolls of toilet paper, and get new tires on your car. Maybe even throw in a few bottles of mustard along the way. It's awesome. It's amazing. But listen, we all know that a trip to Sam's Club is not a daily thing. You go once in a while. The point of Sam's is that you buy bulk. You buy it at a discount, you buy bulk, you buy more so that you don't have to go back all the time, right? Sometimes we treat our relationship with God like a membership to Sam's Club. We come on Sunday, we go to an event, we get as much as we can, so we don't have to go back for a while. I wonder if this is how Abraham operated. He gets a fresh vision, he gets his strength renewed, he makes some great decisions, but when all of that hasn't happened for a while, he starts slipping back into his old patterns, his old practices, his old ways of thinking, his old ways of making decisions. Listen, the moment that we step out from our dependence on God, we are prone to go back to the old ways. The minute that we step out from our dependence on God, we are prone to go back to our old ways of selfishness, self-reliance, self-dependence, self-preservation. It's all about fear. 
the writer Robert Robertson who wrote the, the um, hymn, Come Thou Fount. You know that, that song. It has a, a line in it, prone to wander. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the one I love. Interesting, if you look up his, his life story, he grew up on the streets. His father died when he was eight, eight years old. Saw a lot of devastation. A lot of his friends die young and just assumed in his mind that that would be the way he would go too. But somewhere in his teenage years decided, I want to make a change in my life. And he went to a Methodist church where George Whitfield was the preacher. About three years of sitting under George Whitfield and, and considering his own sinfulness finally invited Christ into his life, and he became a preacher of the gospel. Two years after his conversion, he wrote the lyrics to this song. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the one I love. And unfortunately, a few years into his ministry, that's exactly what he did. He completely walked away from his relationship with God. It's recorded that uh, one day he was in a... a stagecoach riding and a, a young woman was in the stagecoach with him and she was humming the tune to a song which happened to be this song and he said to this young lady do you know the lyrics to that song and she responded by singing prone to wander lord i feel it prone to leave the one i love she said do you know are you familiar with that song he said, I wrote that song. I wrote that song many years ago, and I would give a thousand worlds to have the same experience now that I had back then. And shortly after that stagecoach ride, he gave his heart and life back to Jesus, went back to preaching, and preached until he died in 1790. An incredible story. But that is the nature of all of us. We need a daily relationship, a daily connection, a daily touch from the Lord. Some of you remember a song by Lanny Wolf back in the day, a brand new touch. Lord, you know I need a brand new touch. My strength from yesterday is gone. But if you'll give me just another touch, I'll have the strength to carry on. We need that. Jesus calls it our daily bread being filled up with his presence. We don't have to come to church to get that. Listen, we're not a wholesale club here. This is a daily relationship. This is a daily thing. He wants us to keep coming to him. He wants us to be filled up with his presence, with his promises, with his power to receive a daily outpouring of his love. Jesus said, give us today our, our daily bread. Lamentations is recorded, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I will hope in him. We can never have too much of God. We can never have too much of God. We need him daily. First Chronicles 16, 11 says, seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. So scripture gives us these, these words like continually and daily, earnestly, diligently, with all your heart, always a relationship with God. We need him. We can't, nor do we want to do this life without him. I can't imagine doing life without Jesus. I can't imagine being able to make the choices and decisions that I can to allow my life to be where it needs to be without Jesus. I can't do it on my own. I don't know what I need. The thing that I think I need ends up being the wrong thing. Just like Abraham, the thing that he thought he needed was, we'll just, we'll just say you're my sister, and that way both of us will live. He was looking at just self-preservation. The reality is that whole thing could, be, could have been completely different Let's go back to Genesis 20 and read the rest of the story. That night, verse 3, God came to Abimelech in a dream and told him, you're a dead man, for that woman that you have taken is already married. But Abimelech had not slept with her yet, so he said, Lord, will you destroy an innocent nation? Didn't Abraham tell me she is my sister? And she herself said, yes, he is my brother. 
I acted in complete innocence. My hands are clean. In the dream, God responded, yes, I know you are innocent. That's why I kept you from sinning against me and why I did not let you touch her. Now return the woman to her husband and he will pray for you for he is a prophet. And then you will live. But if you don't return her to him, you can be sure that you and all your people will die. Abimelech got up early the next morning and quickly called his servants together. And when he told them what had happened, his men were terrified. Then Abimelech called for Abraham. Imagine what he's going to say to Abraham. This is what he said. What have you done to us? And that's a good question, isn't it? What crime have I committed that deserves treatment like this, making me and my kingdom guilty of this great sin? No one should have ever done what you have done. Whatever possessed you to do such a thing? And Abraham replied, I thought this is a godless place and they will want my wife and will kill me to get her. And she really is my sister, for we both have the same father but different mothers. And I married her. He's like trying to go back to excuses. How, how quick are we to like justify ourselves and make excuses? When God called me to leave my father's home and to travel from place to place, I told her, do me a favor. Wherever we go, tell the people that you're my brother, that I am your brother. Then Abimelech took some of his sheep and goats and cattle and male and female servants, and he presented them to Abraham. He also returned his wife Sarah to him. Then Abimelech said, look over my land and choose any place where you would like to live. And he said to Sarah, look, I am giving your brother a thousand pieces of silver in the presence of all these witnesses. This is to compensate you for any wrong I may have done to you. This will settle any claim against me and your reputation is cleared. And then Abraham prayed to God and God healed Abimelech, his wife and his female servants so that they could have children. They were stricken with infertility because of the choice that Abraham had made. For the Lord had caused all the women to be infertile because of what happened with Abraham's, with Abraham's wife, Sarah. Just a couple of observations here in the story before we move on. One, does it seem like King Abimelech is better or has better morals than Abraham the prophet? Second observation, I want you to know this. Good morals aren't going to stop anyone from sinning. Good morals aren't going to stop anyone from sinning. Only God can help you with that. There are a lot of people who have good morals. And there are a lot of good people with good morals who call themselves Christians. But unless you fully trusted God and surrendered your life to him, you can't do it. This King Abimelech was not a godly man. Listen, good conscience isn't the same as God consciousness. A good conscience... Conscience isn't the same as good conscience. The Bible teaches us that our conscience isn't a perfect guide or a perfect gauge for determining what is right and wrong. Our conscience can be weak. Our conscience can be corrupted. Our conscience can actually be dead. You see, we hear people saying, just follow your heart. Listen, do not follow your heart. Don't follow your heart. The Bible says in Jeremiah, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. You go following your heart, it's going to lead you the wrong way. Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart above all else for it determines the course of your life. Proverbs 3.5, trust in the Lord with trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. It goes on to say, in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight or direct your path. We need the voice of the Holy Spirit constantly speaking into our lives. We need to tune our hearts. We need to tune our ears to recognize and to listen to his voice. We need the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Not just to feel shame over our sin or fear of judgment, but to convince us. That's what conviction is. Conviction means to convince, to convince us that we need God in our lives. We need a savior. We need him active and daily, his daily presence in our lives. Listen, the Holy Spirit points things out in us. Satan points things at us. There's a difference between pointing out and pointing at. Listen to what Psalm 139 says. Lord, search me. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. 
point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Psalm 19, how can I know the sins lurking in my heart? Cleanse me from these hidden faults. Keep your servant from deliberate sins. Don't let them control me. Then I will be free of guilt and innocent of great sin. We need the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes when the Holy Spirit convicts us of something, it doesn't feel good. You ever been there before? Because if the Holy Spirit's convicting me of something, that means I'm probably in the wrong somewhere. And there's a little bit of pain in that of saying, oops, I shouldn't have done that. Oops, I'm gonna pay a price for that. Oops, there's gonna be consequences. Or it may just hurt. I've got to admit that I'm wrong. There is a, a young lady named Gabby Gingras. You may have heard her story, born in the early 2000s. Gabby, you can look up and read her about her on the internet. She was born with an extremely rare condition of not being able to feel pain. It's called CIPA, congenital insensitivity to pain and anhydrosis. She can feel touch, but, but there's something missing in that touch to relay to her brain that she's feeling pain. We all might be saying, thou, that would be really nice to not feel pain. I could uh, do away with Advil. I could do away with Tylenol. I could do away with uh, any kind of Novocaine when I go to the dentist and not have to get those silly shots and have my mouth swell up for half the day. You think of all these things, and it might sound good, but, you, but what we realize is it's dangerous to live without pain. Pain is not necessarily a bad thing. I know that there are a lot of people who are living with pain, and I, my heart goes out to, to those people who are, who are struggling with that. But just one of the issues that Gabby's parents dealt with when she was just a toddler, when she started teething, you know how babies chew on, on things. She would chew on her hand so much that her mom said her hand, hand looked like raw hamburger. Her inside of her mouth was so raw, and at one point they had to hospitalize her for a month because her tongue was so raw and so swollen she couldn't drink. She was just doing what was natural in her body, but she couldn't feel any of the pain. They, as a toddler, had to sew her eyelids shut because she had scratched her eyes so much that it became infected and swollen, and she's blind in one eye now and can hardly see out of the other eye because she couldn't feel any pain. When she was diagnosed, she was the only one that they knew of in the United States and one of only a dozen people in the world at that time who had this condition. So there was no support group. There was, I mean, they were having to learn things the hard way. But imagine what it would be life like without pain. It wasn't until uh, she went on a, on a circuit and was on shows like Oprah, where she gained some notoriety, and other people said, hey, we've experienced the same thing, and they started a support group called The Gift of Pain, which I think is so fitting for this message today. Physical pain is, the, is your body's alarm system saying, hey, something's wrong, and it needs attention. She had broke a leg or something like that in a fall, and for a month, they didn't even know it was broken, because she didn't didn't have any pain. Physical pain is the body's alarm system. Spiritual pain or conviction is the spiritual alarm system in our bodies that says something isn't right here. It needs attention. Pain doesn't feel good, but pain is necessary. Pain is actually a gift to help us, to protect us, to prevent us from further harm and damage. And it's the same with our spiritual convictions. There's time when the Holy Spirit will touch something in your life and you go, ouch. And here's what we often do. We just step away and say, well, I, I don't like that feeling, so I'm just not even going. Maybe it's the Holy Spirit nudging you to go through that thing because you need to get stronger and grow through it. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17, Paul says, With the Lord's authority I say this, live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness and they wander from the life that God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against me. They have no sense of shame. Depending on what version you read in the Bible, if you read the King James, it says being past feelings 
Other versions say being calloused or hard-hearted and unfeeling, having lost all sensitivity or having lost all sense of right and wrong. They have, they have stifled their consciences and they live going on for a lustful pleasure and eagerly practice of every kind of impurity. But that isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you have heard that Jesus heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life that is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes, put on your new nature created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Listen, we can't afford to tune out or turn off or turn down or silence the voice of the Holy Spirit, the conviction of the Spirit in our lives. That is a recipe for disaster. Do you understand? We need the voice of the Holy Spirit prompting us, that still small voice that will urge us. And if we become numb to it, if we ignore that voice, it's going to get weaker and weaker and more silent and more silent to where we can't even hear anymore. And then we're in a bad, bad place. We are to live holy lives as followers of Jesus, set apart, set apart to God and set apart from sin. But if we develop God consciousness, If we don't develop God consciousness in our lives, then we become numb to him and blind of our own spiritual blindness. Listen, we will never arrive spiritually in our lives to a point where we're incapable of falling back to our old ways and old patterns of doing things, to our previous sins. We will never be immune from doing something sinful or evil. We have to realize that we are all capable. I'm capable of doing absolutely anything sinful, wrong, and immoral. I'm always just one decision away from a disaster. I can never say that would never happen to me. I can never say I would never do that. I'm better than that. That's the point of the title of the message today, never say never. I want to be better than that. I don't want to do anything sinful or harmful, but I'm capable of committing the worst sins anyone has ever done. Me. I want to say I would never cheat on my wife, but I'm not ever going to say that. I'm going to say I never want to do anything that would bring reproach on this church or on the church as a whole or Christianity. But you know what? I'm very capable of doing that. I'm very capable of making a decision that would ruin my marriage, that would ruin my ministry, that would hurt and harm this church for a long time. I have to realize that I am capable of doing that. And the minute that I say I'll never do that, watch out. Watch out. The Bible says pride goes before destruction, haughtiness before a fall. Pride leads to disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. Listen, the last thing I ever want to do is hurt or harm my wife by doing something in our relationship that would hurt that. The last thing I'd ever want to do. We have to set up safeguards, guardrails, protections in our, in our life, accountability to protect us. We all need that. When I was 15 or 16 years old in a small little Assembly of God church in Inola, Oklahoma, in a youth group that consisted of about six to 10 kids on any given night, myself and my two sisters were part of that group. And I can tell you, I remember very vividly in my mind a youth group on a Sunday night before church, about five o'clock on a Sunday night, and our pastor talking to us, saying, listen, you've got to make choices and decisions in your life of what you will and won't do before you ever get in that situation. So if you don't ever want to drink, then you don't go to places where drinking happens. If you want to save your purity until your marriage, then you don't wait until you're in the back seat of a car with the opposite sex to decide, okay, I gotta decide what am I gonna do and how far is too far. And that very night he said, you, I mean, we, I remember writing down on paper what I, what boundaries I was gonna set for myself. We have to decide way beforehand before we ever get in this. Guardrails, you know what guardrails do? 
If you drive on the highway, guardrails are there. It's those things that are on the side of the road on a curve or a turn or where there's a hill down here. And it is far in away from that danger. You set a guardrail. A guardrail is there to, to protect and it's there to direct. It's to keep you on the right path. And so we need to have these guardrails. Call it the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Call it, what, I mean, whatever he's spoken to you to say, this is how to do this. There are a lot of people making other decisions, but I know that I am not going to do certain things. I'm not even, this is what happened. I had two friends in my youth group who were my age. In a small little church, there were two guys. It was the providence of God. I moved there when I was a sophomore in high school. And there were two friends that I made who were my best friends in high school. And they went to my church. And out of, that, out of that meeting of us thinking of what we're going to do, we decided, we made a little pact. If there's ever a party that we get invited to, we already have plans. We already have plans. We don't know what those plans are, but I can say if, if someone invites me to a party, I already have plans for that night. Wait, that's two weeks away. You already have plans? Yep, I already have plans. Our plans were that we were doing something together. And all I had to do was call up Doug and Preston and say, hey, on Friday night, such and such, we're going to go to Tulsa. Is that okay with you? That's, that's all we needed to do. Guardrails. I'm telling you that it saved me and protected me from a lot of hurt and a lot of harm in my life. I'm so thankful for that pastor that, that did that with me. And as a youth pastor, I did that with students too. If you were in my youth ministry, you remember us doing those types, of, those, ty those types of talks and figuring out those types of responses. And listen, that's not just for teenagers. I don't care how old you are in the room. You've got to have safeguards in your life. You've got to have guardrails set up in your life to say, this, this is what I'm going to do. Listen, Abraham should have never even gone to Gerar. There obviously was a propensity to lie in his life that probably came from a parent and a grandparent. He handed that down to Isaac. Isaac, it, we're going to read it eventually. Isaac does the same thing with his wife, Rebecca, to Abimelech. Lies to Abimelech and says, no, nope, she's my sister. Can you believe that? Don't even put yourself in a place where you're going to have to lie to protect your wife. Go somewhere else. He should have never went to Egypt in the first place if it caused him to lie. Listen, if you are an alcoholic or have a propensity to, to that, don't go rent a, 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 an apartment above a bar. Right? Don't just go into the bar and sit down and say, I'm going to see how strong I am. Don't do that. Don't go into the bar. You don't have to go there. Listen, if you are a shopaholic, don't go to the mall. Malls are dying anyway. There you go. Cut up your credit card. You don't have to spend money. I'm going to invite the worship team to come. If you say no to the opportunity to sin, then you don't have to say no to sin. If you say no to the opportunity, then you don't have to say no to sin. We need the Holy Spirit. We need his conviction. We need his voice in our life. We need a daily experience with Christ. We need to listen to his voice. We need to hear what he's saying to us, and we need to respond to him. What is Holy Spirit saying to you this morning? What is he saying to you? Where in your life are you struggling with the old way of life? Where does it tend to creep back into your life? Listen, he's got the power to help you, to save you, to deliver you. He's there with you. He's always with you. Are you with him? Listen to his voice. Be obedient to what he says. I want to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes in the room, and I want to just ask for this response. We're going to, we're going to end with a time of prayer, and I realize I preach way, way through this, but I don't, want you to, I don't want you to check out on me because here's the deal. The Holy Spirit wants to minister to our lives this morning. With every head bowed and eyes closed today, no one's looking. I just want to ask for honesty from your heart. How many of you today would say, Pastor Jeff, you don't know the struggle 
that I find myself in. You don't know the pull and the tendency back to the old way of life. I can do well sometimes, but there are other times that I struggle. I need the Holy Spirit. I need his conviction. I need to respond to his voice this morning. I need his help. How many of you would just raise your hand and say, Pastor Jeff, that's me. That's me. Raise your hand. Keep it raised. This is no shame. You're shaming the devil. No shame on you. There's no shame for you to say, I need his help. God, would you just help every one of us in the room with our hand raised? With your Holy Spirit power and your strength. Lord, may we find a daily, a daily filling up of your presence, a daily coming to you, a daily surrendering, a daily admitting, I need you. I need you, God. I need your Holy Spirit. Forgive me. Help me. How many of you today, Holy Spirit, is just speaking to you to say, it's time to strengthen your resolve. Maybe everything's good. Maybe you don't, you, you've set up guardrails, but today you're making a statement and you're making a stand to say, I'm going to continue the course and I'm going to do the right things. Even though I might feel like I'm missing out on some things, I've set up some guardrails and I'm going to continue to follow that plan, that path, that purpose that God has for my life. And I'm going to follow that plan with all of my heart. I'm going to trust in him daily. How many of you would say, that's me? I'm going to trust him daily. I know the world that we live in and the world that we live in is getting more challenging all the time. Little by little, things come in and our consciences get seared. And the things that we used to think were sin, we don't think it's sin anymore. Listen, God hasn't changed and sin hasn't changed. We've changed. Our culture's changed. And if we're not careful, we're being conformed to the pattern, to the ways of the world and not being transformed by the renewing of our minds through the Holy Spirit. A lot of hands are raised today. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. Maybe you're in the room today and you have never chosen Jesus as your Savior. I'm telling you, the greatest decision that you could ever make is to offer your life to Jesus. Robert Robertson, Robinson, the guy that wrote the song that I shared earlier, total depravity found hope in Jesus. He wasn't perfect. He fell away. But I'm so thankful for a God of grace who receives us back. A God of grace that even took Abraham in his mess and made a way for him. There's a way for every one of you today. And if you're away from God and you don't have a relationship with him, would you open your heart and say yes to him today? We're going to end just with a time of prayer. And I realize... We've, we are getting close to time, but I want to take the next five minutes, if you can do this, and if you would respond by saying, God, I surrender my life to you. You will come down to the altar and just make a stand today. Shame the devil, if anything else. Let him know where you stand. He will push you and prompt you and pull you and do all kinds of things in your life and you feel like you're just a puppet on a string in his hand. Listen, sever that string and let the Holy Spirit have control of your life. I want to invite you to come and just stand here and say, I'm going to stand because I surrender my life to Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, and I'm giving him room in my life today. As we sing this song, would you do that? And let's just have some time of prayer right here around the altar. In Jesus' name, hallelujah.